Good morning, afternoon, evening uh, to everybody, and welcome to day three of the Mays Genetics Conference. I'm Jeff Rossi Barra uh, at University of California, Davis, and this is the 2021 McClintock Award session. Uh, the McClintock Award is the most prestigious award from the Mays Genetics uh, community, created to memorialize the amazing unequaled contributions of Dr. Barbara McClintock through uh, recognition to the most outstanding plant geneticists uh, of, of today. I'm privileged to introduce today's uh, speaker, the 2021 McClintock Award winner, Dr. John Dobley. Oops, let's see. John uh, started, grew up in Pennsylvania, excuse me, um, and started his career with a bachelor's and master's degree in anthropology in Pennsylvania and New Mexico, uh, respectively. He started his career in Mays with a move to the University of Wisconsin to do a PhD with Hugh Iltis. These are pictures of John collecting Teosinte in Mexico as part of his PhD work in 1977. John's PhD work focused on the morphology, taxonomy, and systematics of Zia, of the genus Zia. And in fact, the existing taxonomy of Zia as we know it is due in large part to John's efforts. And in spite of somewhat mixed feelings about uh, describing new species as shown from this cartoon from one of uh, his papers, John and, and Hugh uh, described many of the taxa in Zia, including new taxa uh, that they described and defined as Zia uh, diploprenist. Uh, John contributed to the rediscovery and description of this diploid perennial and the subspecies Weiwei tenangensis and uh, Zia May's subspecies Parvaglumis. These are two of my favorite pictures from uh, the collecting trips. On the right uh, shows uh, John's laser focus on Teosinte, completely nonplussed and un uninterested in the selenium uh, vine shown pictured with him. And on the left uh, is John posing uh, with a horse and a rifle, carefully shown so that you don't notice that the horse actually only has one eye. Um, John assured me that he actually spent less time carrying a rifle and more time escaping from Hugh to go swimming during his collecting trips. Uh, after his PhD work, John moved to, post, to do a postdoc at NC State with Major Goodman, and there he pioneered some of the first molecular population genetic work in Zia using allozymes. I actually often use this work as an example in workshops on genomic data, um, arguing uh, or chastising uh, many of us that use uh, 21 million SNP data to build neighbor joining trees, arguing that we really haven't learned that much that John hadn't figured out 40 years ago. And indeed, I argue that modern researchers need to be more creative uh, like John and taking advantage of the data and technologies we have at hand. And uh, much of this work, as I mentioned, has, has stood the test of time. And this uh, phylogeny is pretty darn similar to what we would see today. And indeed, although maybe in this community, John is most well known for his careful mapping and meticulous genetics, John is extremely well known in the, in the general field of evolutionary biology and actually is one of the 20 most cited evolutionary geneticists uh, across any organism. After leaving Major's lab, uh, John took up his first faculty job at Texas A&M. Uh, and he was there a few years before he moved to the University of Minnesota, where he stayed for more than a decade. He eventually left uh, Minnesota, and although he had an offer uh, at, at my institution at UC Davis, he didn't go there, uh, among other reasons, because he knew that W22 doesn't grow in Davis, and many of his stocks were in a W22 background. Some of the rest of us, as you can see from my 2018 field, had to learn this the hard way. Uh, instead of Davis, John moved, as we know, to Wisconsin, where he's been since 1999. And for the last five years, he's been the chair uh, of the laboratory or department of genetics. In his own lab, uh, John began to ask questions such as how many genes contribute to the evolution of a new trait, um, the especially novel morphologies and new traits seen in the domestication of teosinte and new morphologies in, in maize. Are these genes regulatory or structural? Uh, do alterations in these genes affect protein function or gene expression? Uh, and using uh, methods that, that we're now familiar with, with, QTL mapping and careful genetics, John identified a number of large effect genes crucial for the morphological transition from uh, teosinte to maize. And I'm sure he'll talk about some of these uh, during his talk today. Perhaps his most well-known and classical work is work on teosinte branched one, 
uh, John with um, John and others mapped this to a QTL on chromosome one. Uh, Teosinte branch one, as we know, is responsible for uh, tillering, branching, and some ear traits uh, differences between maize and teosinte. And then using transposon tagging, John was able to show that it, the teosinte branch one gene was the actual causative or the actual gene responsible. And uh, through many years of really beautiful work, eventually was able to track down the causative mutation to a transposon insertion in an upstream regulatory region uh, of the gene. This is the first domestication gene to be isolated, one of the very first QTL cloned in any plant, the first long distance cis regulatory element shown in any plant, um, and still one of the most elegant and striking demonstrations of the functional relevance of transposable elements in uh, plant genomes. In total, uh, John's lab showed the importance of a small number of large effect genes, uh, that these genes uh, tended to be transcription factors and that most mutations in these loci were themselves regulatory in nature and often found, or the vast majority found, segregating in natural populations, that is, instead of de novo mutations. But John hasn't focused only on individual large effect loci. Uh, John is well aware that, that those that handful of loci don't explain everything that's going on. Um, his lab has also conducted very careful genetic analysis of what he's referred to as the dark matter of the genome or the genetics of domestication from assessing uh, uh, quantitative, from using quantitative genetic approaches to assess additive genetic variants in the wild teosinte populations and how that has constrained the morphological paths that domestication could take to reconstructing genome-wide regulatory networks and how they've been rewired and the contribution of cis and trans regulation to uh, changes during domestication. In addition to his work on the genetic basis for domestication traits, um, John's work has also taught us much about the evolutionary history of domestication. For much of the 20th century, the origin of domesticated maize was unknown. Uh, in fact, some, uh, some workers were even unsure what, what continent maize came from. And as we know, Beetle made a very solid case for Teosinte as a direct ancestor of uh, of maize, but much of, teosinte, uh, much of uh, Beetle's work used multiple different teosintes, and it wasn't exactly clear uh, how maize originated from teosinte. John's efforts, beginning with his alizyme work um, in Major's lab and culminating in this wonderful paper in 2002, uh, determined uh, definitively not only that maize originated from subspecies Parvoglumus, as shown in this phylogeny, uh, but also that maize had a single domesticated origin as opposed to multiple independent origins in different, in different parts of the world. Uh, other evolutionary work from John's lab include looking at maize teosinte introgression and the spread of maize across the Americas. He's also used selection scans or population genetic approaches to identify loci targeted during uh, maize domestication and adaptation. Unlike the rest of us who are often satisfied with a list of candidate genes that we get out of that population genetic work, um, John's lab, of course, has, has done the hard work to track down the function of some of these genes. In fact, recently publishing, I think, the first example of a gene uh, initially identified by a population genetic, SAGL1, that uh, he's now shown the, both the molecular function and the phenotypic effects of that gene. And while John's own research is often literally a textbook exemplar of genetics, John himself has made major contributions to undergrad education co-authoring one of the most widely used genetics texts. Indeed, his chapters in this Griffith Dobley et al. textbook on population quantitative genetics and transposons set the text apart from its competitors and are really the, the main reason why uh, I and many others have been using this text in our genetics classes for many years. Um, in addition to John's research contributions uh, and, and contributions to education, John has made a number of other important contributions to the maize community. By my count from maize GDB, there are almost 2,500 stocks in the stock center that John has developed, including inbred lines, mapping populations, and the recent TONAM. Uh, and these populations have, and these stocks have continued to allow exciting discoveries from Feng Tian's work on uh, on leaf angle that was using one of John's mapping populations to our understanding of structural variation between maize and teosinte in this genome assembly of the teosinte in red line that John developed. Finally, uh, perhaps John's most important contribution to the community has been in training. Initially, I wanted to make a slide of all of the folks from John's lab and where they are and quickly realized that this was a fairly daunting task. 
Uh, but suffice it to say that scientists from John's lab can be found across the world at numerous universities nationally and internationally at the USDA, at all of the major seed companies and multiple other biotech companies as well. Given his groundbreaking work on maize genetics and domestication and his tremendous contributions to the maize community, I can't think of a better way to sum up John's work or, or his merit in earning this award than this wonderful quote from Steve Tanksley, that Dobley can be considered among a small handful of individuals whom I would consider living legends in genetics. On that note, I'll cede the floor to John. Please note that you can ask questions during his talk on the tab on the right of your screen, and uh, John will answer those at the end uh, of his talk. Thank you, Jeff, for that introduction, and I appreciate your getting up so early to do it. Uh, I'm honored to receive this award, and I do so on behalf of all the folks I've worked with over the years. The committee gave me an assignment today, and that is to give a lecture that highlights the contributions of Barbara McClintock to Mays Genetics. Not surprisingly, this is very easy to do given my research in the genetics of maize domestication. To start, I'd like to say I recently had the pleasure to revise the chapter on transposons in the textbook Introduction to Genetic Analysis that I co-authored. In revising the chapter, I saw that the way we often teach transposons is to emphasize factual data rather than the logic of genetic analysis. We teach the taxonomy of transposons, class one, class two, gypsy-like, and so forth, and what percentage of this or that genome is composed of transposons. Perhaps most of you could tell me the percentage of the maize genome that is composed of transposons, but how many of you could explain McClintock's experiments that led her to conclude that there were mobile genetic elements in the maize genome? Uh, far fewer, I would wager. In revising the chapter, uh, I made Clintock's logic much more central to the chapter. And I need to thank uh, Jim Birchler, who generously helped me understand her work. Uh, these are not mugshots of the FBI's most wanted, but uh, the Strogues Gallery uh, are my mentors. Uh, frankly, I, my undergraduate advisor here in the upper left, Marshall Becker, was the most critical. He gave me my first research project took me to my first scientific conference. Uh, he challenged me. I still email with him today. He really cast the die of my career. My master's thesis advisor, Ursula Bohr, um, taught me something very important, that I should challenge my own ideas and set out to disprove my hypothesis more so than to search out information to support them. Uh, you will this. My PhD advisor invited me into the world of maize domestication and taxonomic botany. Major Goodman, in the lower left, and my first postdoc advisor, taught me how to make maize pollinations and to test genetic hypotheses by the analysis of progeny of crosses. Thanks to Major, I was hooked on genetics. And Ron Sederoff, my second postdoc advisor, led me into the world of molecular biology. Over the last 37 years, I've been fortunate to have worked with so many talented students and scientists. Um, they get the credit for the McClintock Prize. And as you'll see today, when I mention many of them and their work, uh, they did the work. Uh, sadly, I won't be able to mention all of them, but they all are part of the story. I need to make one special acknowledgement of my PhD student, Nick Lauder, as many of you know, Nick left us at far too young an age a few weeks ago. He was such a delight as a student. Uh, we all will really miss Nick. I have um, far too many uh, collaborators over the years to name individually, um, uh, but this list shows that the spirit of May's cooperation is strong. I will highlight a few of these collaborators in my talk, but unfortunately, not all who deserve mention. So here's what I want to do today. 
tell you a little bit about the origin of May's story. Is Teosinte the ancestor of May's? And um, what role my research over the years has played in confirming that Teosinte was the ancestor of May's? Then if Teosinte is the progenitor of May's, what were the genetic and developmental steps in the transformation of Teosinte into May's? I'll tell you how my group mapped and characterized a few of the genes involved. And then <clears throat> finally, after that, I'll offer one short story from my lab on how the genome has been altered extensively beyond the few major genes that we've been able to characterize. Okay, all of you know Mays here on the right, and um, many of you know Teosinte here on the left. Their plant architectures are remarkably different, although they are the same biological species and interfertile. Teosinte is highly branched. As shown in the cartoon, it has long branches that have a tassel at the tip and ears borne along the length of the branches in the axils of the leaves. Modern maize, by contrast, has one or two short branches. It's essentially an unbranched plant. And at the tip of the branches, there is an ear and not a tassel. So these differences in plant architecture uh, reflect different degrees of apical dominance. Maize has more apical dominance. And I think maize too can be thought of as a plant with a constitutive shade avoidance response. More extreme than the differences in plant architecture are the differences in ear architecture. Teosinte has only 10 or 12 kernels per ear, and um, they are all sealed in hard woody casings called fruit cases. We actually don't see the Teosinte kernels in this photo. Modern maize, on the other hand, has hundreds of kernels, and they're born on the exterior of the ear. The same organs and tissues that compose the fruit case around each of the teosinte kernels forms the central axis or cob of the maize ear. So these differences are really profound. And 100 years ago, it was difficult for most biologists to believe that teosinte was the ancestor of maize. How could ancient plant breeders possibly have converted teosinte into maize? No other crop species differs so radically from its ancestor. So with these vast differences in morphology, a controversy arose. Um, where did this crop plant, known only as a human domesticate, come from? What was the wild plant that gave rise to maize? The photo shows two of the major antagonists in the debate surrounding the origin of maize. One is Paul Mangelsdorf, and the other is George Beadle. Uh, here they're shaking hands at the end of a conference at Harvard University on maize domestication in 1972. Mangelsdorf was a Harvard professor, member of the National Academy of Science, a member of the Academy of American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he dominated the field of maize domestication. He hypothesized that there was once a wild maize that looked pretty much like cultivated maize, but went extinct in the wild. Humans did not breed made from teosinte in his view. He thought maize evolved in the wild by natural selection, and humans only rescued it from extinction. He even went on to propose that teosinte was derived from cultivated maize and then escaped back into the wild. He published this theory in the top journals like Science and PNAS, uh, so it must be true, right? Uh, he rose to the highest levels of academic stardom, and he dominated the field for 30 years. There were a few, but mostly mute, objections during that period to Mangelsdorf's ideas. Uh, then in 1970, Mangelsdorf got some sustained pushback uh, uh, to his ideas, and it came from George Beadle. Now, Beadle was also a member of the National Academy and the Nobel Laureate. Beadle actually proposed then that Teosinte uh, was the uh, ancestor of maize and not some extinct wild maize. 
And as you might surmise from the grin on Beetle's face in this photograph, uh, Beetle won the debate that day at Harvard. Coincidentally, Beetle was one of McClintock's fellow graduate students in the laboratory of Rollins Emerson at Cornell, uh, and they studied May cytology together. So what led Beetle to conclude that Teosinte was the ancestor of maize? Was well, one of Emerson's students, he saw the Teosinte chromosomes look just like maize chromosomes. He crossed maize and Teosinte and observed that they were fully interfertile. And as shown by this F1 ear, uh, you can see it has full seed set. The F1 hybrids had normal meiosis, normal chromosome pairing, the combination fraction between linked genes in a maize teosinte cross were about the same as that between those genes in a maize maize cross. He concluded that maize and teosinte were members of the same biological species. Furthermore, he argued since teosinte is a wild plant and maize only known as a domesticate, made much more sense to propose that the wild plant was the progenitor of the crop rather than the crop, the progenitor of the wild plant, as Mangelsdorf had said. Beetle further supported his analysis or his ideas by an analysis of 50,000 maize teosinte F2 hybrids. In this population, he observed maize and teosinte parental types at a frequency of about one in 500. And he concluded that as few as five major genes plus many smaller effect genes selected by ancient breeders could have converted teosinte into a useful crop plant. <clears throat> so in 1970, my PhD thesis advisor, Hugh Iltis, uh, entered into the debate on maize desiccation uh, on beetle side, if you will. Uh, he had the perspective of taxonomic botanist or morphologist his insight was that since the maize ear was the target of human selection, it was not ideal for understanding the relationship between maize and teosinte. He thought it'd be better to study the tassel, which was not a target of selection. So I was recruited uh, to collect thousands of maize and teosinte tassels and form herbarium specimens like you see here on the left. And uh, what I like to say is I spent my youth gluing uh, dead plants to cardboard. It's every bit as glamorous as it sounds. But I also got to measure dozens of traits on thousands of tassels and do statistical analyses to understand how maize and teosinte were related. And based on that analysis, uh, Iltis and I redefined the taxonomy of Zia and proposed two types of teosinte we call subspecies parviglumis and subspecies mexicana were the most like cultivated maize and that they therefore were the likely ancestors of cultivated maize. And there's some other teosintes that are quite different from maize and those could be excluded as potential ancestors of cultivated maize. So this slide is a uh, phylogeny from my PhD thesis um, that summarizes my thinking at the time. Uh, you can see this table below, which shows the different traits and how they support the different branching relationships above. For instance, this group of teosintes over here has few stiff tassel branches. This group of teosintes over here and maize has more lax tassel branches. I was also able to make use of data collected by Barbara McClintock and Angel Cato in Mexico on chromosome knobs of maize and teosinte. And their data fit in along with mine, showing that cultivated maize, parviglumis and mexicana, all shared uh, both a mix of terminal and internal chromosome knobs, cementing their close phylogenetic relationship. I want to point out, I left the relationship between these three species undefined. I didn't feel we could say whether maize was domesticated from parviglumis or domesticated from mexicana. The differences between these three were basically in the size of organs. 
And since organ size was a target of selection during domestication, it's a non-neutral trait and therefore not the best for trying to reconstruct relationships. So in 1981, I was fortunate to get a postdoctoral position with Major Goodman at North Carolina State, and their work in the lab of Charles Stuber uh, on mesenteosynthetic isozymes. Isozymes are the best method at the time for calculating genetic distances between species based on the frequencies of neutral alleles at known Mendelian genes. Uh, Goodman and Stuber had built the best system for isozyme genetics of any plant, and that's, I'll say, comfortably. Uh, using their method on teosynthetic, we got a surprise. Parvi blumis, with its smaller organs, was more like cultivated maize than Mexicana, which appeared superficially uh, closer to maize based on tassel morphology. So this result from 1984 was the first suggestion that Parvi Loomis might actually be the ancestor of cultivated maize. Years later in my own lab, uh, we had the chance to look at this question uh, of identifying uh, the maize ancestor using microsatellites or SSRs. My two postdocs, uh, Eve and Yoshi, uh, did all the work. We had better sampling in maize in Teosinte. We had maize from throughout the Americas, all the way from Chile to Canada. And we had a much broader sample of Teosinte as well. We had 96 genetic markers or microsatellites, and they had many more alleles than the isozyme loci I had studied. So what did we see? We saw that all maize from Canada to Central or South America came out in a single clade, and that clade came from within the subspecies Parvi glumis uh, uh, portion of the tree. In other words, this suggested that Parvi glumis, shown by the green branches, was the ancestor of maize. Moreover, we were able to estimate the time of divergence between maize and Parvi glumis at about 900. 9,200 years, which agreed with archaeological data. The SSRs gave us a little bit more refinement in the sense that some Parvi Blumis populations, here shown as stars, were more closely related to maize than other Parvi Blumis populations, here shown as green dots. And that suggested that this region within the red oval was the likely, or at least a candidate for the cradle of maize domestication, because that's where teosinte, that's most like maize, comes from. Uh, now, Jeff's lab um, got involved with this as part of a collaboration with me, and Jeff gets the credit for this. He did a, a wonderful, interesting analysis to reassess the question of where was maize domesticated. Uh, here, what you're looking at is a heat map based on allele frequencies in Landry's maize. The map shows how much genetic drift there is away from an inferred ancestral allele frequency in maize. Notably, the only, only maize data and not teosinte data are used in this analysis. The concentration of dark spots in southwest Mexico say this is the region of least drift away from the ancestral um, uh, allele frequencies, and the area of least drift should be the cradle of domestication. So it came to the same place as inferred from phylogeny. I need to acknowledge uh, Jesus Sanchez, my Mexican colleague uh, and collaborator. Uh, Jesus is at the University of Guadalajara. Jesus knows more about teosinte than anyone else. Uh, importantly, he collected many of the teosinte seeds that I and others have used in our research. This photo taken in 2005 for, uh, during a trip with Jesus when we went to a very large population in the area of the cradle of domestication. Those are all teosinte plants uh, on this hill. 
And if you climbed up to the top of the hill, as we did, and you looked out over the landscape, you saw hill after hill after hill covered with teosinte. So it was very easy to imagine why ancient Mexicans would have collected and eaten teosinte as a wild plant and then bred it into maize. So to summarize this first part of the talk, as Peter proposed, teosinte is the ancestor of maize. Molecular phylogenies indicate that subspecies parvigumus was the teosinte ancestor, and multiple analyses indicate that the cradle of maize domestication was in southwest Mexico. <clears throat> so did you know Barbara McClintock published the first genetic map of maize? It's just three genes on chromosome nine, but it was the foundation for her discoveries of transposons and more. Again, she led the way, and that is why I was able to start my next series of experiments, mapping maize domestication genes. About 1983, I heard an influential lecture on mapping QTL at NC State by Morris Solar. At the time, Charles Stuber was getting started in QTL mapping in maize, and you didn't need a PhD in genetics to realize that QTL mapping could be harnessed to map domestication genes. And I thought I should do that. If teosinte was the ancestor of maize, what genes were altered to change teosinte morphologically into maize? Could they be mapped in the genome? In 1990, we published our first QTL mapping experiment of maize domestication QTLs. Um, I got to work on this project with Jonathan Wendell, who was a fellow postdoc in Stuber's lab. Um, I want to complain about Jonathan. He got me addicted to running and eventually getting me hooked on marathons. Anyway, as you can see, here are the 10 maize chromosomes uh, along the bottom. These gray shaded areas summarize the amount of effect on domestication traits along the genome. So the more taller the gray peak, the more effect on domestication traits. Remarkably, there are six regions, one through six, that have very large effects. And that's a number very close to Beetle's five major genes. So Beetle was right. Uh, like Beetle, we were pretty circumspect in the paper, recognizing the limits of our power to detect small effect QTL, and also the issue of close linkage among QTL. We also noted the correspondence between some of our QTL and known maize mutants. And uh, one that was particularly interested was the correspondence between our plant architecture QTL and a mutant called Teosinte branch or TB1. Uh, TB1, as its name suggests, makes the maize plant branch like a Teosinte plant. It was the perfect candidate gene for our QTL. I want to mention Charles Burnham, my former Minnesota colleague who discovered TB1. And as luck should have it, Burnham was a fellow grad student with McClintock and Beetle in the lab of Rawlings Emerson at Cornell. Also around this time, I read this paper uh, featured on the cover of Science while I was a postdoc. And it was a remarkable read showing how the gene controlling the bithorax complex in Drosophila could be cloned. Before 1980, genetics and development of biology were mostly separate disciplines. Uh, but now there was a marriage of genetics and molecular biology, or development of biology, that really began to pay off. And there were two lessons for me in this. One, that single genes could control complex developmental processes, and those genes could be cloned and characterized. So I wanted to do this. I wanted to clone maize domestication genes. So here's um, TB1, a mutant that we set out to clone. Uh, you can see wild type maize here in the middle. This is a TB1 mutant. And what's remarkable about it is the TB1 mutant has a tassel at the tips of the branches, just like Teosinte, but unlike maize. It was the perfect candidate for our QTL. So how do you clone a maize gene in the 1980s or 
say the 1990s, a transposon tagging was the method of choice or the best way to go about it. So once again, once again, McClintock uh, built the foundation for maze genetics. Um, so I came to the maze meeting uh, early in the early 1990s, and I met Vicki Chandler, and I told her my desire to transpose on tag TB1. Vicki offered me uh, and sent me her hottest mutator stocks, and she sent me all the new DNA probes I needed to fish out the gene once it was tagged. So I made the cross as shown here. And um, I spent the summer, I think it was 1995, walking the rows of my Minnesota cornfield, looking for new mutants where a new insertion into the wild type allele uncovered the TB1 reference allele. And I got lucky and I found three mutants in my field. And the Minnesota people know these are the X fields. The next thing was to fish out the gene and I have to um, give all the credit here to my technician, Adrian Steck. He did all of the molecular biology uh, on this project. He, this is one of his Southern blots. What you see here, this is the mutator stock. This is the reference allele stock. These are some siblings. And this is the new mutant, which has a um, 2KB insertion into the gene. That's a 2KB new insertion. And then next to it is a northern blot. Uh, these are some vegetative tissues where the gene is not expressed. Here in the ear, the maze allele, the teosinte allele, wild types. And then the TB1 mutant, the reference allele, it has a product, but it's too large. And our new mutator allele, the product is gone. And one of the things I like to point out too here is that the maze allele has about twice as much product, or at least a lot more product, than the teosinte allele. Uh, on that plot. So we had succeeded. That's a restriction enzyme uh, map of the TB1 region in tagging the gene. But TB1 is a major mutant. It's not our QTL. We did not positionally clone a QTL. So we wanted to make an argument that this gene was really our QTL. And I did that by a complementation test. I crossed the stock heterozygous for the maize and teosinte wild types alleles to the TB1 reference allele and observed a 50-50 ratio of normal to mutant looking tassily ear plants. And so this was the evidence then that TB1, which we had cloned, corresponded to our QTL from Teosinte because the Teosinte uncovered the maize reference allele. Adrian uh, also assayed the expression level in maize and Teosinte quantitatively. He found that the maize allele was expressed at twice the level of the Teosinte allele. Um, and so domestication seemed to involve the upregulation of the TB1 gene. And then Lauren Hubbard and Sarah Hake's lab, as part of a collaboration, did in situ hybridizations showing that TB1 is expressed in axillary buds, as you see here. So we had a model for the change in maize plant architecture during domestication. The function of TB1 is to repress branch elongation. The TB1 reference loss of function allele derepresses branch elongation. The teosinte allele has a lower level of expression, so you get some branches. And in maize, during domestication, expression was raised so that you have very short branches. So if TB1 was the gene, where's the smoking gun? You know, what part of TB1 uh, controls phenotype? And so I want to now talk about the work to uh, understand that. What we essentially wanted to do was map the controlling factor for phenotype. Richard Clark, a postdoc, and Tony Suter, a grad student, did the work. I also want to express my gratitude to Yo Messing, whose lab built the back takes to span the 160 KB uh, from TB1 to the next gene upstream. And uh, I really miss having Yo as a colleague. Uh, as shown in the graph, 
Richard and Tony collect a set of crossovers between maize chromosome, thin lines, and teosinte chromosomes, thick lines. And then they did a analysis with the isogenic stocks for each of these recombinant chromosomes to evaluate what part of this region between the two genes controlled phenotype. So what did they find? Well, they, their analyses involve some rather complicated statistics, but I'm going to present it in a much simpler way here today. Um, there's the TB1 upstream gene, and they found this control region in the center, 60 KB upstream from TB1, controls phenotype. Here you can see that you have less tillers with the um, W22 chromosome in that area, and more with the teosinte chromosome in that area. Internodes are longer with teosinte, and there's more kernels per ear with maize. So an introgression that's exactly that big, it's not a very big introgression, uh, controls those phenotypic traits when you compare the maize teosinte alleles. They also had some uh, crossovers within this area we called the control region and found that the proximal portion of the control region alone controls all three traits again. The effects are not as big as the full control region, but it has an effect on all three. And the distal part of the control region affects two of the traits. It affects the two plant architecture traits, tillering and internode land, but it doesn't affect the ear trait. So not only is their control region 60 KB upstream from the uh, coding sequence, but it's complex with at least two different components. And uh, finally, for me, I like to say this is, for me, the gold standard for calling something a domestication gene, that you can take intergression lines with maize versus teosinte allele and show that they control phenotype. So <clears throat> now back to Barbara. Um, remarkably, or perhaps not, the left and right portions of the control region each contain a transposon element insertion, as shown on this map. Uh, one is a torus element, a type of mite, and the other is a hopscotch retrotransposon. Shown by this pink shaded area, too, that's a region that shows the signature of non-neutral evolution or a past selective sweep, suggesting that it had been the target of selection during domestication. So we wanted to ask, were these two transposable elements, the smoking guns of maize domestication? In the kind of time-honored tradition of reduction of science, we had another hypothesis to test. So Tony Studer did this experiment um, to do a functional test of what those transposon elements were doing, where they were inserted. Um, he used a transient expression assay to see if the control region with those insertions affected the expression of a reporter of firefly luciferase. Um, and what he found is shown on this graph. And first I have to say that for the torst element, he got an interesting result, but it didn't confirm that the torst element affected phenotype. But for the hopscotch element, he got the result that did confirm it. When the hopscotch element is in the construct, expression goes up about twofold, which, and if you take the hopscotch element out and just have the maze control region, it goes back to the lower level, like the teosinte control region or a uh, minimal promoter. So what this told us is that the hopscotch element seems to be the uh, controlling mutation for the change in gene expression at TB1. I think Barbara McClintock would have been um, very happy uh, with this result. So Tony did another experiment. <clears throat> and part of the motivation here was when they found the control region, it had no effect on the male to female transition. So the teosinte part uh, control region still gave you an ear entirely at the tip of the branch, and there was no effect on the sexual transformation 
from male to female. So Tony um, did a further fine mapping of this region of chromosome one where TB1 occurs, and he defined the minimum of five additional genes differentiating maize and teosinte, including two we call enhancer of TB1.1 and enhancer of TB1.2 that affect the male to female trans, um, transformation. <clears throat> Next here, we decided to go after those genes. I don't have time for much of the story, but my uh, former grad student, CJ Yang, uh, cloned one of them. He cloned ETB 1.2, which is a YABI class transcription factor. And it has an allelic series. And he was able to show that some of these alleles differ by transposable element insertions. CJ also showed that TB1 is upstream of YABI, this YAB 2.1 gene, which is the ETB 1.2 gene, and that it controls uh, an influence on internode length within the ear. So um, at this point, I'd like to introduce my newest postdoc, Jinga Tian. And she's following up on project to clone two of the genes that function to convert tassel into ear from Teosinte. And you can go hear about her work at poster 98. I'm going to switch now to one more gene um, and, or one last trait. Teosinte has uh, these hard fruit cases surrounding the kernels, and maize are naked on the ear. We mapped a QTL for fruitcase formation and got a big hit on chromosome four. As you can see in this QTL map, this one QTL basically controls the trait with all other small effects, uh, with a few other small effect QTL along the chromosomes. But since this QTL behaved like a single Mendelian gene, we named it as such TGA1, Teosynthate Queen Architecture 1. And um, as luck should have it, my uh, UW colleague, Jerry Kermichael, had independently discovered this factor, and we worked with it together. We worked with Jerry together on this. Uh, this factor is really important because it freed the kernel from the fruit case and made the kernel then much more accessible for humans to use as food. To give you some idea what this single QTL does, this is a normal teosinte fruit case. And here's one with the maize allele of TGA put in by back cross breeding. And you can see that the kernels are much more exposed because the fruit case is actually not fully developed. And this is the reverse introgression that Jerry made, which has the teosinte allele back cross bred into maize. And you can see that single QTL causes uh, fruit cases to form on the maize cob. So this just tells you how remarkable developmental genetics really is. So we set out to clone TGA. Um, we did this and discovered it was an SBP binding domain transcription factor. Uh, Tina, my technician, worked with me to do everything to actually map it down to the gene. Wai Wang did a incredible series of molecular biological experiments to figure out what the uh, protein was doing. And he worked with his technician, uh, Bao Guan. And then Kirsten Bamlis also helped with me uh, to figure out the structure and expression of the gene. So I need to thank uh, Anthony Rafalski and Baylin Lee at DuPont, who sequenced the backs that allowed us to get down to this gene. And Anthony is another person that, um, sadly, um, uh, I am missing as a colleague. My grad student, Zhang Zhao, did the population genetics, and she found there was a single fixed amino acid difference between maize and teosinte, a lysine in teosinte, and an asparagine in maize. And this seemed to be our smoking gun. Um, Wai Wang took charge of figuring out what the effect of this lysine to asparagine change was on TG TGA function. 
We use the transient expression assay. I don't have time to fully explain this experiment and the constructs that are shown here on the left. So I'll just focus on the graph on the right. Uh, what you see is that the tiosinte amino acid, uh, the lysine, shows an expression of the firefly luciferase reporter, the same as a neutral control. So tiosinte, like the neutral control. But if you swap in the maize amino acid, the asparagine, the expression of the reporter firefly drops dramatically to the level of a known repressor from Arabidopsis. So what this experiment told us is that the single amino acid change has converted the tiosinte TGA protein from to be less of an activator and more of a repressor of its targets. Um, <clears throat> why did a lot of molecular biological experiments, this is one uh, where he showed that uh, with an electrophoretic mobility shift assay um, using random oligomers that tiosinte, maize and tiosinte both um, recognize the same binding site, GTAC, but there is a difference in that maize has a lot of dimer and very little monomer, and tiosinte has less dimer and more monomer. And so why well, think, uh, and I agree, that this change in the proportion of monomer and dimer is causal to the effect as a repressor on the uh, target genes. Why well, also <clears throat> looked at um, some suspected targets, MADS genes, this class of transcription factors are known to regulate MADS genes. Uh, here he tested eight of them, six of the eight with, uh, if you compare the tiosinte allele and the maize allele in isogenic background, you see the tiosinte allele is expressed higher than the maize allele, thus the maize allele acting as a more of a repressor of the target. And he confirmed by CHIP that TGA binds to the promoter regions of these target genes as well. So work from my lab and many other labs in the maize genetics community sort of allows us to assemble this picture of sort of a domestication gene network. I don't have time to go through it step by step, um, but um, you can see that all of these domestication genes we've identified so far work in this common network. Um, because, perhaps because of experimental bias, TB1 is at the heart of the network. Interestingly, uh, much if not all of the network is downstream of 5B and the shade avoidance pathway. Uh, many of the genes in this network appear to have been targets of selection uh, during domestication as shown by the red starburst. So we can think of domestication as a modulation of a pre-existing developmental network uh, to create traits of benefits to humans. So to summarize the second part of the talk, uh, QTL mapping allowed us to clone and characterize some major genes. Um, a little more skeptical, the QTL mapping gives us a very good overall picture of the genetic architecture of domestication. I think we're missing a lot. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, thing I like to say, too, is that for me, the gold standard is if you can create isogenic lines and show a maze and tiosinte allele have different phenotypic effects on the trait, then you know, really know you've got a domestication gene. And finally, everything we did in this area was based on pioneering work of Barbara McClintock on mapping and transposable elements. So here's my one last quick story. This is Zach Lemon, a grad student in my lab. And Zach did an experiment to um, look for genes with cis regulatory differences between maize and tiosinte. Don't have time to go into the experimental details of how he did that, but here are the results. He found about a thousand genes with cis differences between maize and tiosinte, hopefully at some stringent level of statistical support. Uh, that's a lot of genes. Uh, Zach looked at three different tissue types, ear, leaf, and stem, and 
as expected, Ear had the most of the more uh, cis different genes than either leaf or stem. Most of the genes that he found are tissue specific. They're only different in one tissue, in many cases, because they're not expressed at all in the other tissue. And um, he sort of fit the picture with the ear having the profound difference in morphology and having greater differences in cis regulation of its genes as compared to Tiosinte. There's one interesting observation that um, we made, or Zach made in this paper, and that is if you look at all genes overall, like this first column here, the expectation under the null hypothesis that 50% of the time, the maize allele will be expressed higher, and 50% of the time, the teosinte allele will be expressed higher. But it actually turns out the maize allele is expressed higher about 55% of the time. And that is statistically significant. That's for all genes. If you focus in on those genes that show cis differences between maize and teosinte, and this shows uh, stronger and stronger evidence that maize and teosinte differ, then the tendency is very strong that maize alleles were generally upregulated during domestication. So you have um, a sort of bias towards upregulating genes when you domesticate maize. There are two other studies that showed the same thing. One was from Nathan Springer's lab, looking at uh, maize and teosinte seedlings, and the other a EQTL study uh, in Fang Tien's lab. So this seems to be a secure result. And it's also interesting that the same thing has been observed in two other crops, in cotton and cassava, that the cultivated species has upregulation of its genes relative to um, the wild species. And I think this is a really interesting question for future investigation. So I want to summarize now. Um, uh, so, and put it this way, I'll use this sort of iconic photograph to summarize my talk. Emerson here. Uh, inspired this incredible team of maize geneticists. Charles Burnham discovered the TB1 mutant and gave me my first pack of TB1. Marcus Rhodes worked on preferential segregation. I don't talk about that. I have never studied it, um, but it also ties into Teosinte. George Beadle solved the problem of the origin of maize. And Barbara McClintock established so much power in maize genetics that people like me could do the work that we wanted to do. Great. Thank you very much, John. Um, and we have a bunch of questions. Um, Let's see, let's get started here with the questions. Uh, first from Matt Hufford. What are your thoughts on the initial appeal of Teosinte to humans given the remarkable differences from maize? Yeah, so this is a topic on which many people have speculated. George Beadle thought maybe as popcorn. Hugh uh, Iltis thought they might have used it like sugar cane. Um, others thought they might just grind up and eat the whole thing uh, with the hard cases. My thinking is those people back then 10,000 years ago were every bit as smart as us. And actually they knew much, much more about nature. We're kind of idiots when it comes to the natural world. And they had some clever way of getting the grain out of the fruit case. What that was, I don't know, but I think uh, they were uh, quite adept at uh, doing it. And then a question um, from Nathan Hancock. Do you have a hypothesis about the order in which these genes might have been selected during domestication? Yeah, I don't have any data. I think that's a population genetics question. I'm not sure if there's enough data left in the genome to answer it. Maybe someone like Jeff will figure that out someday. Uh, I think that probably TGA would be a real benefit early on because it made it much more useful as a crop plant. So you might think on that basis, TGA could have been selected early, but who knows? Um, 
and then uh, for the fields of teosinthes, you showed those nice pictures of the parvoglumis. Do you ever see a spontaneous mutation of these domestication genes? They likely won't survive, but I'm curious how labor intensive the identification of early domestication traits was from Marin. So this is actually, I can use this question to give an answer. I, I think the domestication is really complex, uh, highly multifactorial, polygenic. And so the individual genes that contributed to domestication probably have no visible effect on an individual plant level. The only good exception to that would be TGA. And uh, I've never seen a TGA mutant uh, in the uh, field, uh, but George Beetle famously uh, led a mutation hunt in about 1970 to search through teosinte fields and find the uh, fruitcase mutant. And um, so I don't think they found it, but they collected a lot of useful teosinte seed that's been uh, used in many experiments, including mine. And then a question from Sanjin Liu about the interpretation of a single domestication. Does that just mean that parvoglumis is the sole source of domestication or, or is there some other meaning in single domestication? Yeah, that's a, um, so I, I guess what we are responding there in part is there were kind of ideas out there that maize was domesticated in South America and domesticated in multiple locations and our data didn't fit that model. Um, if it were domesticated multiple times, you might expect multiple different alleles of TGA, but we found just one allele of TGA fixed throughout all of maize, suggesting uh, a single domestication. Again, the hopscotch element uh, is the only mutant we know. It's actually not in all maize, but it's in the vast majority of maize. So again, it looks like a single mutation uh, suggesting a single domestication. With that said, uh, maize hybridizes prolifically with teosintase all over the place. And so I think post the initial early domestication, there must have been lots of gene flow between maize and teosinte. And Matt Hufford has actually shown that quite elegantly, uh, where maize introgressed with uh, Mexicana teosinte in the highlands of Mexico. Then from Liz Lee, a great talk, John. Are you suggesting that part of maize evolution was targeting the shade avoidance response? That's the way I, yeah, that's the, uh, I don't know if it's the model I use. Um, the um, maize is unbranched and that's uh, part of the shade avoidance response. You uh, stop branching and you increase your level of apical dominance. You produce fewer ears. Um, I th yeah, so that's one part of the story. I just put it there. I think another part of the story, I think, is harvestability. And um, this is uh, where I like to put it, which is not original with me. It comes from Steve Tanksley, I think. Uh, if you're going through a field, do you want to harvest 100 small ears, each with 10 kernels, or one giant ear with 1,000 kernels? Either way, you're going to get 1,000 kernels, right? So it's much easier to harvest a single ear than many small ears. So there was some uh, harvestability selection done to reduce the number of years and have more kernels per year. Now, I think that is probably a trait that is to some extent controlled by the same genes that control shade avoidance. Um, let's see. And then um, some recent studies have suggested that it's possible to de novo domesticate wild ancestors. If we can also de-domesticate teosinte to create an, uh, or re-domesticate teosinte to create a new maze, could you share your thoughts about uh, the new maze that you'd like to create if you could do this? Oh, uh, interesting question. Um, uh, could we read? The, yeah, I think I the way I would do it is like by classical plant breeding, maybe with genomics uh, thrown in, like gen genomic selection. Uh, I you probably my guess is. You, using CRISPR or editing the genome can get you a little bit of a distance. I, uh, maybe I'm out of, out of vogue, but I think classical plant breeding and uh, genomic selection are probably much more powerful to get far. Uh, so what would it 
what's the second part of the question? Like, what would it be like? I don't know. I mean, the I think the people who did it were pretty smart. You know, they got a plant that uh, uh, is now the number one crop in the world, and it's grown all over the world. So I always like to say when I taught economic botany, the uh, Native American plant breeders were the best in the world. They did a far more creative job than the people in the Middle East or Far East in terms of the diversity of crops they created and the vast differences between their crops and the wild ancestors. So it's really Native American um, plant breeding was uh, uh, quite, quite inventive. And then I think we have uh, time for maybe one more question um, uh, from Maud Tenayon. What was for you the most surprising and unexpected result that you obtained in your career? Something that has changed completely your way of approaching your research? Surprising. I, I sort of alluded to this today, but I, I would say I underwent, it wasn't like a surprising in one specific moment, but I would say I underwent a very slow conversion from thinking that a few major genes uh, fix everything to coming to believe that uh, it's much more complex and it's like, you know, like an infinite number of genes of small effect is uh, where the really the true story is. So that uh, was an idea that uh, uh, that I don't want to say it surprised me, but it just took me a long time to come to grasp to like, grasp that. Great. Well, thank you, John, for those answers and for the wonderful talk. And congratulations again on on the McClintock Award. There are more questions um, in the on, in the discussion, on the live discussion. So if you could please go on and answer those questions. Um, we'll end here, but I'd like to remind folks that session eight is starting in a few minutes. To access session eight, you'll need to go back to the agenda page uh, and find uh, session eight. So it won't be on the same uh, Zoom link. Um, and thank you, John, and thank you all for your, your questions. Okay. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, everyone.